Hello everyone, and welcome to the Written Word Podcast. As always, I am your host, Darius Finisar. Today we are exploring a topic that has come to interest me recently. As a young writer myself, I have often wondered and daydreamed about what publishing my first book would be like. Fortunately for us writers, in a modern age, we have more options than ever before when it comes to getting our work out there. We will be discussing the merits of self-publishing when compared to more traditional means of publication. To help me explore this topic, I have interviewed Mary Ann Mahanraj, a writer herself and a professor of English at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Mohanraj has published multiple books and stories over the years, ranging in works of fiction and nonfiction, sci-fi and fantasy, and erotica. In the works, she has a Sri Lankan American cookbook called A Feast of Serendib, which she is crowdfunding. So far, she has made a surprising $10,000 of her $4,000 goal. So without further ado, here is the interview with Mary. I might be interceding in some places to offer up some more uh, commentary and clarification. Uh, Hope you guys enjoy and see you at the end. Before we get too deeply into the topic, can you tell us a little bit about your experience as a writer? Sure. Um, So I've I've done a lot of, you know, I started writing uh, about 25 years ago. So when I started back in 92, 93, uh, we didn't have the web. Uh, it was before the web was invented, and uh, so there were news groups, and uh, I started putting stories up there in the very early days. My blog is actually the third oldest blog on the internet because I've been doing this for so long. Uh, but for publishing, I, I didn't think of that as publishing, and I followed a pretty traditional path. I got a copy of Writer's Market and Poet's Market, and I um, just followed their instructions and sent stories out, sent poems out. Um, for the most part to pretty low paying places or places that only paid in copies and got a lot of publications that way, which was great. It gave me confidence. Uh, And then I started after a while taking my writing more seriously. Uh, I started an online magazine. I've actually run a couple of them at this point um, and published other people and uh, have since done work for Penguin, Random House, HarperCollins, a bunch of small presses, and I have self-published a couple things, um, including uh, this new uh, cookbook. The, the, the two books of fiction that I have uh, self-published um, kind of went in different directions. One of them was a children's picture book that I just wanted to do with a friend. And that's actually, I think, a good cautionary tale because I uh, didn't really know anything about children's picture books. I just thought it would be a cute idea. And so I did it wrong. I put way too many words on every page so that, you know, even though we made uh, an attractive book and my friend's a beautiful artist, when we took it around, we printed it up and took it around to bookstore to bookstores and ask them you know if they'd be interested in carrying it and very quickly we learned that nobody wanted to carry it um, because they took one look and said well nobody's going to buy this book because it has too many words on the page and parents who are used to reading to their kids know that their kids are going to be too impatient to get through like to sit there and listen to you read 200 words right you want like 10 words on a page and this is sort of obvious in retrospect but it didn't occur to either of us and because we didn't have kids and we weren't used to doing this and because we didn't have an editor we missed this like completely fundamental element of picture books hey guys i'm jumping into the interview here to say one quick thing it was pretty surprising to me as a writer to hear that uh it makes complete sense when you think about how difficult it is to sell children's book i once heard that the children's books market uh, was the toughest one to get into and be successful in either a book is a hit or a miss when it comes to kids and you can never be too sure about what or what works or doesn't work i'm next in in the interview professor mohan raj will go more into her personal experiences with getting her work crowdfunded and self-published so that's sort of, sort of something I would warn people about is that I think a lot of times people move into self-publishing because they think, oh, this will be much easier than going through regular channels of traditional publishing. It's faster. In some ways, it's easier. In some ways, it's harder because you have to do five people's jobs 
Um, but you can also just go really wrong because you don't know what you don't know until you're um, until you're in the midst of it. So that book, I actually will probably, you know, I've sold a few copies at conventions to, you know, hand selling to people at tables, but mostly I think we just need to completely redo it um, as a chapter book if we actually want anyone to buy it. Uh, the other book I did on Kickstarter, um, and that one, uh, we I raised eight thousand dollars, half of it to cover the printing costs, and half of it to cut and distribution costs, and the other half to pay me. Um, but in the end, it actually got picked up by a small press. So was this the Demimond? Project? Yeah, on Kickstarter, it's listed as Demimond, although we changed the title to The Stars Change. Um, and so I actually wrote back to all my Kickstarter backers and said, hey, you gave me this money so that I could self-publish. It looks like it's going to be a small press. Do you want your money back? And one person wanted her $10 back. Um, but everyone else basically said, we just want the book to exist. And however you bring it out doesn't really matter to us as long as we get the copy that we asked for. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so that was great. So it didn't end up being self-publishing. Um, it, it meant that... You know, because I had raised some money, I didn't need an advance from the publisher. So they were able to bring the book out, taking less of a financial risk themselves, right? Typically, they would pay me something and cover the costs of produ producing and distributing the book, right? So, um, in fact, like part of the money I raised was I raised a thousand dollars. I budgeted a thousand dollars to pay an artist to do a cover image and interior illustrations. So that's, again, saving the publisher money. Um, they probably wouldn't have spent the money on the interior, but I really love books with interior illustrations. So it gave me the freedom to be a little more creative, to have a little more control of the process. So this didn't really surprise me. One of the reasons why self-publishing can look so attractive is the amount of freedom and creative control it can give to you as a writer. You don't have to have someone else breathing down your neck on what you don't or do have in your story. However, that isn't always a good thing when trying to get your work out there, as Professor Mohan Raj will explain next. Um, but, you know, I, I guess here's another cautionary tale. I'm a pretty good writer and, and, and experienced and I teach it and I was about, you know, 18 years into being a writer at the time I did this. And still, when I gave the editor at, at Circlet Press the manuscript, she read through it and she found two things that um, one uh, sort of a tone thing that she wanted to be amp up, which I agreed made it better, but one sort of critical thing that there was this central scene that was a climactic scene, and I had sort of done it in summary, and she said, you know, this is like a, a really important decision-making scene. Why didn't you write it out as a scene? And I, I kind of looked at the manuscript, and I was like, Ugh. She's totally right. You know, like I had just, it was going to be hard. And so I'd sort of skimmed over it. And because it was like a dinner party scene with a lot of people arguing and, you know, lots of voices going. And that's just kind of a challenging scene to write. But it was the heart, in some ways, it was the emotional heart of the book. And so I'm really grateful that she, that I had an editor who was able to look at it and um, help me make the book better. And so that's, you know, one of the, problems with self-publishing I think is that if you skip the editorial phase then you you sort of risk putting out something that isn't your best work and that may mean that a year later you're looking at it and you're frustrated um, and thinking oh, I wish I wish I had somebody look at it and you can there are ways around it you can if you've got a really good critique group giving you feedback um, you know, you can ask for beta readers online and, you know, if you have, if you've got like a good community forum, you could get a hundred beta readers giving you feedback. That's not going to be the same as a professional editor because they, they might not, they won't be able to, often they won't know how to fix a story. They might be able to tell you where there's a problem. Like I was getting bored around here um, or I got confused, but a, a good editor will be able to do more and give you more. So I'm on a self-publishing forum and a lot of people there actually pay, budget and pay for editors um, as part of it. So they really are acting kind of as their own publishers um, and, and taking on all the pieces of what a traditional publisher does, including editing and paying for it. So. 
So, as Professor Mohan Raj explained, it really is important to have a professional look over your work. Although you might have your own beliefs about how good your work is, these professional editors and publicists know what does or doesn't sell in the market. Going the traditional route of publishing means you will have professionals looking over your work. If you are going to self-publish, you should still set aside a budget for paying an editor to look at your work. And if you don't have the money, it really pays to be a part of your own writer's group or community. Uh, people that are willing to take that crucial second look at your work. So, with that, let's get back to the interview. Um, okay, now I've like talked for a long time in answer to your one question. Oh, that's, so. this is good. Yeah, I mean, a lot of I've done like my like some research, some articles I read. Um, looks like a lot of the complaints are that you know all these jobs, you know, the editor, the the cover designer, the marketer, uh, all these. Uh, people are like basically you know they're making more money than the actual writer of the book themselves would you say that's like true hmm not if you do it right (laughs) you know um i would say it's interesting i haven't actually seen that complaint and i i feel like i'm curious who's saying that because i'm think well that to me that is a sign that they are not Either they didn't write a very good book, or they're not marketing it well. So, just as a point of clarification here, by research and articles, what I really meant was, um, what I was talking about were these posts that I was finding on Medium. Um, A lot of these articles were talking about how the publishing industry was somehow skewed, or even in some extreme cases, outright broken and unfair. Some talked about how they felt marginalized or treated unfairly by uh, white male editors or people who did not represent the minority of writers. This topic in of itself is a uh, one that's worthy of its own podcast, definitely. Uh, but Professor Mohan Raj assured me uh, that if you are a good writer, you usually don't have to worry about that. Uh, so let's get back into the interview. All right. Um, because you should make more than, as the writer, you should end up making more than all the people who you're paying pieces to. Like for for right now, for this Kickstarter, for the cookbook, I am paying um, a layout person. Oh, I can't remember because there are a couple different editions of the cookbook. But let's say I'm paying them uh, $500 per edition for layout. I'm paying the cover designer similarly. Um maybe a little less i'm paying the uh some interior artists um i'm paying a publicist um and then so let's say all of that comes to like three thousand um maybe a little more and then there's distribution costs um built in so that's going to be say another another two thousand for actually printing the book and shipping it to people um that's obviously variable depending on how many copies i i do but but um i'm actually we can you can sorry it's kind of like complicated because that's built into the price of the book right but um whereas the rest are fixed costs that will apply to all the books whether you write you know so so some of this basically goes away as an issue if you sell enough copies right um if you if you budget four thousand dollars and then you sell five copies of your book then you're taking a huge loss. You're never going to make that money back, right? If you budget $4,000 and you sell 500 copies of your book, maybe you're breaking even. If you budget that and you sell 5,000 copies, then you're making a very nice profit, So, which goes to you. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the tough part of this is often being realistic about how many copies you're likely to sell. And... Uh, new writers can be very optimistic about that and not have a good sense of what the market is or how well they'll be able to access the market, right? If you don't put the money and or effort and or time into publicity, you could write the best book in the world, but no one's going to hear about it. And then they're not going to buy it, right? So um, I think if I could say like one mistake I've made in my life as a writer um, and that I think artists of all kinds make all the time is we make great work and then we don't publicize it enough um and so you know 
I can't tell you how many times I'll, I'll, a friend of mine will say, oh, I didn't even know you came out with a book last year. And I'll be like, damn it. <laughs> you know, like, how, how did I not? I thought I told everybody, but I guess I didn't. And I also, you know, there's a saying in publicity that you have to touch someone seven times with a piece of information before they're ready to buy. Because things just, people forget, they go out of their head, they're like, oh, I can't afford it right now, whatever it is. And so a lot of PR is just the very repetitive telling them over and over and over again. And if you're not willing to do that yourself, then you got to hire someone to do it. And it should pay for itself if you've got a good product, right? If you don't have a good product, then, you know, you can, you could publicize it all you want and it's still not going to do well because people will a couple of people will buy it but then they're going to read it and they're going to be like eh, and they'll leave you a one-star re- review on amazon and then you're in trouble right so yeah i guess it's hard for new writers to gauge how good their work is like yeah no I, unless they get like a professional opinion through yeah you know I, that, that's a, or they do research right they really do research you know if you are writing You've got a great idea, okay? It's something you've never seen before in, in say, science fiction. You're like, this is amazing. I totally think a ton of people would buy it and read it. Okay, great. Then you write it, and you do a good job. You show it to people. You have good feedback. Your readers love it. Um, you're, maybe you even pay for a professional editor. Your professional editor says it's really, really good. Okay, so now you've got a good book. So then you have to decide, does it make sense to crowdfund it or traditionally publish it, right? And there are pluses and minuses. If you crowdfund it, you can probably get it out faster. You don't have to go through the whole sequence of sending it out, finding an agent, if it's a book length thing, et cetera, so on. So if you if you are impatient and you want to get it out the door quickly, then you can crowdfund it. You will also keep a larger percentage of the profits. Like the book I did with HarperCollins, I think I made something like $2 a book on a book that they were selling for $20, right? Um, and that's typical because they get a chunk, the distributor gets a chunk, the artists get a chunk, the, you know, like, so the writer ends up getting a very small percentage out of that. If you self-publish it, you will get maybe half maybe even more depending, right? Again, depending on how many copies you sell, really. Um, the, um, but the, the publisher is going to have much more reach than you, generally, because they've been doing this a long time. They have a distribution mechanism. They have resources, you know, with Bodies in Motion, which HarperCollins bought. They, um, first of all, they paid me a $25,000 advance on the book. So, for me as a writer, I didn't spend any money and they handed me $25,000 and that was just an advance against royalties. If the book had done really well, I would have gotten more money down the road, right? Then they took it to Germany, to the German book fair, the big the big fair, uh, where all the translation rights get sold and they pushed it there. Their PR people pushed it and they got it. They sold translation rights in six languages. So they actually sold enough First of all, my book got translated into six languages, which is super cool. But also they sold enough through that um, to cover my advance before it even came out in America, right? So then any copies they sold in America, that money was on top of the $25,000, the royalty money that I got. So if you think your book has a chance of going big, I would say give it its best chance and at least try traditional publishing. Give it a year, maybe two years, unless unless the book is time sensitive or you are in dire need of money tomorrow, right? Um, your, your odds of a like, bigger payout are better with traditional publishing, right? And, you know, more publicity, more, you know, they will do things like they will spend money to place your book on you know, in magazines on the summer read list and things like that. There's a lot of things that are bought and paid for by the publishers as part of their publicity budget that you probably, A, don't want to spend that money and B, don't have access to it, right? So, you know, so given all of that, why crowdfund at all? Well, like for the cookbook, I'm crowdfunding it because um, because it's, these days it's actually really hard to sell a cookbook unless you have, they want you to have a platform. So when I was shopping it around to publishers, and I did take a year to shop it around to traditional publishers, 
but they came back generally with, well, we like it, but you don't have a restaurant, you don't have a super popular YouTube channel about food and cooking. The brand, basically. Yeah, you don't have, you don't have something that's going to guarantee a certain percentage of sales. You don't have a TV show. And um, cookbooks are just such a huge risk because these days a lot of people just get their recipes online. They don't buy cookbooks, right? Not the way they used to. So at, at the end of that process, I was like, oh, okay, I'm probably not going to be able to sell this to a traditional publisher. Or if I do, it's going to be very small and they're not going to put a lot of money behind it. I actually think I can do better myself. And then it was, but then I had to set aside time and be like, okay, look at my calendar. When do I have at least a month that I can basically dedicate to promoting the cookbook, right? So I just wanted to emphasize one thing here. Um, it's really important for writers who are crowdfunding their work to have a schedule set in stone, such as a month. Donators like to see that you're on a tight schedule and that you want to get your book out there as quick as possible. They like to see that you have a game plan and so they are more willing to donate before they miss their chance. So that's a lot of work to get done in one month's time as Professor Mohan Raj will explain as you'll see with the next part. And I'm still teaching and I still am trying to write other things and I have other emails to answer. And so every day I'm trying to put in maybe two to three hours on PR for the cookbook in a variety of ways and managing the production of it. I have to, you know, talk to the indexer and uh, take a look at cover designs from the layout guy and, you know, proofread everything and, you know, oh, and I think I'm going to add one more recipe. And like all of that is just super time consuming. So um, any kind of self-publishing, if you're going to do it to a professional level, is is a big project, right? And because you really are trying to do several people's jobs, it can be really satisfying. It can let you do things that the market is not willing to take a chance on. So if you have a quirky project, if you have something where you know how to access a dedicated audience, like I don't know, if you write a book on fly fishing and you are the vice president of America's Fly Fishing Association and you can send a note about your book to every one of 12,000 members, then maybe that makes sense for you. They Niche publishing, right, is what it's called, um, is generally um, a, a pretty decent option for self-publishing and crowdfunding. But if you're basically writing fiction... Um, I would not recommend it. I would, I, you know, I would just say you're, you're in some sense, you are potentially hamstringing your future career by giving away some of your, you know, possibly your best work, some of your early work, um, and you're not going to get much for it, right? So I know it's hard to be patient and slow <laughs> and uh, wait, and, and it's, it's hard to cope with the rejection. And I actually think that's a lot of why people try to self-publish because they don't want to gather the stack of rejections from magazines and so on. But that's how you learn, right? That's when you're learning is when you're sending things out and you're getting the feedback from the editor and they're saying, you know, well, you had this good idea, but it didn't really grab me, right? So then you're like, all right, I got to work on making it more grabby, you know, or whatever it is that they're, that they're saying to you. I'm just curious though, like if they yeah. say that this doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Can you like revise it and send it back to them again? Or are they just gonna like... Kinda... It depends. Usually no. If they want you to resubmit, they'll generally say so. And that does happen. I've had pieces where when I was editing an anthology, there was one author where I actually looked at four drafts because there was something, I told her, there was something I really liked about her story, but her writing skills were just not quite there yet. Mm -hmm. And we actually went back and forth and each draft she made it better, but it wasn't quite there. Um, and, you know, then finally it got to a point where I was really happy to take it. She has since gone on to become an award-winning novelist, right? So, um, but that was early in her career. So, uh, usually, but even if you don't give it back to that editor, there are a lot of magazines and a lot of publishers out there, right? So you can take that, revise the story and send it out. I recently saw the story that had been rejected by 12 places. Um, and I went through maybe three revisions over the course of time. So the the version that eventually sold was very different from the version that went out initially. So I didn't revise it every time because sometimes it's just like, well, they didn't like it, wasn't the right thing for them. Maybe somebody else will. But 
occasionally as time went on, I was like, oh yeah, I think, I think I can make this piece better. Right. So. So that was the end of the interview there. Professor Mohan Raj had to go leave and go teach a class. Uh, I just wanted to take the time again to extend my deepest thanks to her for the time she took to talk to me about this topic. I know many writers are interested or have thought about getting into self-publishing. Professor Bowen Rausch's experience and advice was really helpful and insightful to me. But I just wanted to reiterate an idea Professor Mohan Raj was talking about and that I think is crucial for all writers to understand. Don't give up on the traditional publication industry. I know it could be really frustrating and maddening to get dozens and even hundreds of rejection letters back for your hard work, but all of them should serve, at least you should look at them as a learning experience in understanding what does and doesn't work in your writing. Once you are able to make and sell your work uh, with more confidence, then I would recommend uh, getting into self-publishing. Either way, don't give up on your work and always be open to how you can improve uh, on your writing, on your stories, your characters, your settings, and everything. Don't sell your best work off prematurely. Take it to an expert or a dozen of them first. Um, so that's all I have, guys. I hope this episode is as helpful to you as it was to me. Uh, just keep on writing, and I'll see you next time on the Written Word Podcast. Thanks.